Thank you, Mr. Nathan, for agreeing to do this interview for us. It's really a conversation and we're the Institute for Societal Leadership and that's why we're keen to hear from senior societal leaders um, over this series of interviews. Can you tell us which were some of the key events that shaped you? Well, I'm not sure whether there were any specific events that shaped me. As you went along in your career, you did, you did face the challenges of each job because I was not trained for any of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a higher qualification. So for me, it was learning on the job. Mm -hmm. So I suppose each of those jobs left their mark on you. You, you learn from them. You learn from the mistakes you made. Uh, you, you, you learn from the successes you achieved. But you, you never know how much each of it had an impact on you. So what what touched me most when reading your book was your early life, you know, and the struggles. Yeah. Do you think that has made you a very different person than if you had a comfortable life or a regular life no, I in think your so. early days? Having such an early childhood, you learned about the good things in life or bad things in life. You learned about good people, you learned about bad people. You learned about things you should not do and which others were doing or misleading you to do. So you grew up uh, ahead of your times. Uh, and then uh, also in the early period, you, you went through the Japanese occupation and you also learned from that because you saw people in the raw, people who were exploiting each other People were putting some into trouble, others were saving others. So you come across the reality of life face to face. Given what you've seen of the Japanese occupation, humanity, the good and the bad, has that caused you to have more faith in humankind or less? I can't say I have more faith on humankind. I learned what is real, what's, what one can expect and what should not place too much of faith on it. So nothing specific. Uh, as, as I said, you saw humankind at its best and its worst during the occupation. And as a young boy, it impacted on your mind. What to avoid, what not to. Which was the toughest portfolio you had in your career? Uh, well, each one depended on the times. What was toughest at a, at a certain stage was overtaken by some new problem. So you can't specifically say a job was the toughest because we were all acting uh, with little or no experience. The leaders were also learning on the job. We were learning on the job. And we were not an independent country before. We didn't have any of the institutions that other countries had before they att uh, attained certain nationhood. We were just caught overnight and with no support services, no experienced people. So we were really t struggling to do what we had to do, not knowing whether what you were doing was likely to succeed or likely to become more problematic. That unpredictability was one of the jobs that you found in the early years of our independence. Can you give us one example of when you had this challenge and you had to make a decision? Yeah, you know, we were handling the uh, crisis for about a time of the, the two Indonesian KKOs who were under trial and, and he, they had exhausted all the opportunities of appeal through Privy Council and others. And there was a tremendous amount of uh, tension in Jakarta and we were, and our embassy was sacked. But at the time, there was a problem of repatriating them after they had paid with their lives. So one night, the Indonesian ambassador came to the foreign ministry at about 1 a.m. 
and said, you must return the body to us because we are going to place it in the embassy for people to pay their respects. Now at 1 a.m. I didn't have the chance to go and consult anybody. So straight away I told him, as far as they were, they paid their penalty in Singapore, it's under our law. And we don't do such honours for them. If you want, you can take the bodies out. And once you're outside Singapore territory, you can do what you want. Of course, he was angry. I said, no, that's the opposition. Uh, he used a lot of businessmen from Chinatown and others who had Indonesian connections and to th threaten me that, you know, they will be wider repercussions for this. I said, I didn't care. That's my decision. So next morning when Do Dr. Go came to the scene, I told him this is what I've done. I didn't have it too late for me to consult you at night. He said, no, you're right. That's the right stand. But until the stand was taken, the, the repercussions on that stand were unclear. So it's a kind of tense situation. So have there been clashes where you feel a certain decision was the right one or that we have to do the right thing, but your superior or whoever you were working for at that time did not? come to that same conclusion and took a different decision? Well, I was fortunate enough that many of them were accepted. I can't pick of one event where my superiors had, had rejected mine and overruled. I'm sure there must have been many occasions where what I had suggested were modified or changed or rejected. But even if they were rejected, I had the good fortune of working to superiors who always explained why what I was proposing was not a good idea. Maybe there was an alternative. And that was what we learned from the founding leaders. They always listened to us and then later told us or why it could not be done, or why it should not be done. What was the other alternative? So they were always one step ahead of all of us. Who do you think most influenced you out, out of all these At different times, uh, people. Dr. Go, while well, I worked in Mindef with him, uh, Mr. Rajaratnam, a man of ideas, philosophy, and tremendous patience. He was not, never flustered by things. PM Lee, Lee Kuan Yew, from his passion with which he pursued objectives for the improvement of Singapore, for attaining what was needed and taking very tough decisions, uh, not popular ones. Each one must have had impacted on me in one way or another. But all three of them made me feel that I was walking the road with them. And what they were striving to do was also my, my obligation. It is a tremendously, uh, what shall I say, stressful times which they were going through and you working for them you felt the impact of it. Sometimes they were impatient. You had to understand they were impatient not because they don't like you but because of the circumstances that had to be overcome. So you, you, you experienced from that that we were walking a common cause. And we were in that time of history, you know, whether the same circumstances will prevail now, I'm not sure, but whatever it is, it is an experience. You mentioned that time of history, and I remember what Mr. Ja uh, Raja Ratnam said, that on my IC, I am an Indian, right? But I don't care if you call me an Eskimo or an Indian, as long as you 
consider me a good man. And that's, you know, his view of the world that is not about race, it's about an all-embracing um, ethos of nationalities just working towards good. And that was very good for Singapore at that stage of nation building. So when did you feel the sense of being Singaporean? We were subsumed under the Malayan identity. And of course, we never call ourselves Singaporeans. We said we were from Singapore. We were from Malacca, from Penang, but we're all Malayans. Okay. And then, you no, know, after the war, when citizenship was formally introduced and became a subject uh, to be addressed, then you call yourself Singaporeans. And also, cut off from Malay the peninsula or at independence, that Singaporean identity became more, much more uh, impacting on us. You know, and the first was when the idea of a Malayan, we, the Chinese, the Indians born here, we call ourselves Malayans. Now, once that was rejected, and Malay supremacy was enforced after the war. We were disappointed. We still strove to get back to Malaya. Even as after the PAP government came, the, the, it was on their manifesto about, about merger and all that. So th that was what it was. And then we, that identity was lost. Then we got ours. Malaysian identity. Again, in the Malaysian identity, we were not a prominent member of that. There were, race was still an important factor. Then, when separation came, it, it, we all we, we, we didn't look at the Malayan identity. We started to look ourselves at Singaporeans. So it was a natural transition. Yeah, yeah. Do you regret? the separation? Do you think we could have done better being part of the Federation, even now? I can't, we can't regret it. If we had failed after separation, I would have regretted it. But we, we succeeded beyond our imagination. So we didn't, didn't feel sorry. And I remember an episode you were talking about admiring um, Subhas Chandra Bose, right? Because he was such a charismatic speaker and he was trying to also ask, would you join in the Indian sort of revolt or fight? Um, what kind of leader do you think he was that attracted you to say this is an admirable person at that time of that meeting? I was long distance away, but I had never seen or heard of any person, local, Chinese or Indian or Malay, with that kind of oratory, with that kind of depth of knowledge, and he didn't have a sheet of paper, and he was there before the microphone, the field of hundreds, and he was narrating Indian history, which I had never learned from the British. All the atrocities they committed in India and all that. and. The way he spoke, there was not a single sheet of paper. You know. It impressed me no end. No schoolmaster, nobody could have impressed me with that kind of. And he had, the, and he was speaking in English. And what was more, the hundreds of people who were on the field were people who did not know English, and they were all tongue-tied listening. I was quite impressed as a young boy that he inspired you. And after that. All such persons, even Sukarno, with his oratory, may sometimes may not stand to reason, but it impressed me. Because their words moved you. There was a bond that developed from listening to them. You know? So that's what it was. Which are the Asian leaders who feature highly on your list of You'll be surprised that I began with Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek? You know, he had gone to 
Wong Po Military Academy and all that. Mm -hmm. And he was standing up to fight against the Japanese. And he was able to mobilize people. Although I did not know at that time the poverty of China, but uh, because of impacted by him, I also began to find out more. He was one. I met, uh, the boss was here. And uh, Nehru, Nehru had come here. Uh, Sukarno, I've seen him from a distance. So like that, we've seen quite a number of them. What aspect of them are you, um, were you sort of struck by? for people like Nehru, Sukarno? Is it that openness to ideas or just the charisma? No, like Nehru, he has been educated in England. And yet, he was fighting the British. And he was going to jail several times. He could have, he could have lived a very comfortable life instead of which he did this. So these things impacted me. That, People who are making a sacrifice and striving to achieve something. I could not, in that early stage, understand what was it they were trying to achieve this. All I knew was they were fighting the British or fighting other powers, and they had some aim. What exactly was, the, I mean, independence was a word, but I didn't understand his meaning. But there was something about them. They, they, they had a purpose. Uh, I think my first lesson on purpose was reading about them, listening to their stories. Back around our region, in our own backyard, are there leaders in ASEAN? Yeah, South uh, Asian, P whom PM can, Lee was, you know, definitely was definitely purpose. true. He was fighting against the odds. And mind you, one of, his, one of his greatest contribution is give strength to the Chinese in Singapore to stand up against the communists. They could have easily obliged the Chinese and gone along with the communists. No, they managed to, he managed to persuade them to stand up, that they are different and we are different. Their purpose is not our purpose and gave us the courage to stand. And that is why today we are able to stand up with dignity. Otherwise, it would have been so easy to please the Chinese and join them. Likewise, that's also a problem. Others will do the same to us. The Indians will do the same. The Malaysians will do the same. But whether we are prepared to stand up by ourselves, and if you know, at the time of independence, what was said was that we have to protect our sovereignty. And we want to be left alone to be ourselves. And that is still a very important element in our political life. Today, a lot of people are saying, you know, we should not do this, we not do that. Forgetting the fact that if we don't stand for what we believe in, then we will be cowed by all these other ideas. That reminds me then of ASEAN, and you were there at MFA during the formation, the drafting of the ASEAN uh, agreement. Were there conflicts between the five leaders? I mean, with Malaysia, with Indonesia, they're not on the best terms. We've just left Malaysia. Were there some strong voices, and how was that kind of conflict resolved to get even No, before ASEAN, ASEAN was formed, the effort to work on it came with Indonesia. And they had an officer uh, assigned to bring out a draft, uh, and then for that to be worked on and for all five to come to a common consensus. In, the, in, the first, in that phase, before we went to Bangkok for the inaugural meeting, the draft had most of it as agreeable, but the one element there which Singapore was not inclined to support, 
And that element was that we wanted all foreign powers to leave us alone. And that our military bases should not be established in our countries, foreign military bases. Now, our stand was certainly against that because we were fighting the communists, because we needed to stand on our own, and it would take time before we could do that. But as long as the threat remained, the British presence in Singapore, in Malaya, was for our benefit. And initially, there was thought about getting that matters sorted out. But there's no possibility of an agreement. So the foreign minister, Mr. Rajaratnam, decided he will leave it and go to Bangkok for the meeting. And he felt that Thailand, which is a treaty relationship with uh, the United States, and the Philippines, that is a treaty relationship, and had a powerful American presence in the Philippines, he felt that when it comes to discussing, these two will oppose it because they were very much entrenched in their relationship. But to our horror, when we went to Bangkok, these two, instead of fighting it, decided to support it. So we were left alone. So Mr. Rajaratnam, who was at the meeting, only the leaders were there, we were all outside the meeting. He called me and he said, pack up and let's go. And he went to the door when Adam Malik stopped him and said, come back, Raja, let's talk about it. And Raja, I've never seen him in that angry mood, told him and told all the other ministers, we are fighting for our life. The Vietnam War was going ahead and that's the purpose why we are planning this, uh, this ASEAN gathering eh, that time. You know? our gathering, and you are asking us to dismantle the bases. How, how, do, how can you expect us to do that? Uh, who is going to replace them to for our defense? You know how vulnerable we are, and you, yet you would want to abolish it. I'd, I'd rather not sign the agreement. Then we went back as well. He persuaded Mr. Rajaratnam to come back to the table. And they sorted out, and then we, some of us were called in to redraft the portion where he referred to that. That was a critical moment, and Mr. Rajaratnam had the courage to stand up against his four colleagues. He was persuasive, hmm? courageous and persuasive. Yeah. So do you think there's a certain style you've seen amongst Asian leaders that is you know, very different from how a Western leader would have approached a, a situation. Is there a certain ASEAN, Asian style of leadership? Western leaders use two weapons, religion and the sword. And with that, they dominated Asia. So there's no leadership quality there. So that, that model is not a model for us in Asia and we are trying to avoid it. So what is the Asian way? I don't know. I don't think there's an Asian way. Each one will have to grow in, the, in his own given circumstances. And he has to find. You see the Indians still struggling to find an Indian model because they accepted the British constitution, says state and the federal at the center, and they're sometimes very much tied because of that. They can't make it momentum. On paper, it looks very nice, what one should do, what should not do. But when you're dealing with human affairs, these things don't come. They come as they happen, and you have to find solutions. India will find their own solution, maybe it take a longer time. China has found a certain solution after Mao, and that's also beginning to have its problems. Japanese had another one. So each one will grow in their own circumstances. And I don't think you can have a model. 
If you're economically success, you have a good model. If you're economic failure, what model is there? I'm going to bring you back now, almost at the end of it. Do you worry about Singapore at all? Its future? I, uh, I don't have state? much time. So because Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said he feels we're still on shifting sand. Foundation is not there. No, he's strong. the leader. He, Do you feel he is the same way? No, no. I can't. I won't generalize and say I worry. All people of my generation will worry because what has been achieved can easily fail. When you, and because of that, there is a worry. In what form that worry will develop, why it will develop, we do not know. Uh, it must be some people who are in their 50s and who have still some 20 years to go, at least, that they will have, they will think through and say, what is there to worry? What is the scenario that is likely to emerge that will worry you? Can we avoid that from happening? These are questions that they will have at least 20 years to work on, not my generation. So the pioneer leaders, I mean, the approach is definitely, like you said, different from the current government because we're in a different stage of growth. Um, what do you think is the approach or the current style of our cabinet ministers that is very different from the early generation, which is... For circumstances are different. What the earlier leaders were found were one situation and one set of problems which had to be addressed. Now today, many of the problems are municipal. They're domestic problems. They have to be addressed differently. You can't apply the, 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 the approach taken by the founding fathers, by the next generation of leaders. This has happened worldwide because they were fighting for independence. It's over then, it was a matter of governance, of establishing uh, practices and in institutions. So you can't make, it's not a comparison of apple and apple. What are your hopes for future leaders? What would you like to see in them? Circumstances will throw different leaders in different times. Thank you very much, okay. Mr. Nathan. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us.